What is your favorite sexual position? Oh, I guess I'm kind of, oh, this is, this is so uncomfortable. <laughs> Girl, you've got questions. Questions about your body and how to feel good in it, about your hormones and how to keep them in check. Questions about your sex life and your whole health. Can you imagine having a best girlfriend who was also a triple board certified OBGYN? A girlfriend doctor you could call and ask or tell her anything. Someone who could show you how to live any stage of life before, during, or after menopause in a big, bold, and beautiful way. Well, friends, I'm your girlfriend doctor. I believe you were meant to flourish and shine, to embrace life and awaken to all its possibilities. Let's get there together. Welcome to our show. Well, welcome to the Girlfriend Doctor Show. I have Zyla here, and um, she was feeling lonely because her mama, my daughter, um, went uh, out for a little bit. So I am dog sitting this sweet beast. And go down, Zyla. Okay, go down. All right, not supposed to be on the furniture. Don't tell your mama. Well, welcome to the Girlfriend Doctor Show. <laughs> it's great to be here with all of you this new year. We've had an exciting run of guests. Every episode has been just transformational. Advice for transformation. And who I'm talking to today is a dear friend, a colleague, and a transformation expert, actually. Because, you know, you talk about new you, new year, new you. Well, he literally does that. He focuses on bringing up out, the best attributes we have in, um, in a way that is authentic and yet, you know, very creative. He's a plastic surgeon. He is known as America's holistic plastic surgeon. His name is Anthony Yoon. I call him Tony. He is an uh, MD physician and nationally recognized board certified plastic surgeon. He's been recognized as a leader in his field and the author of the best selling books, The Age Fix, a leading plastic surgeon reveals how to really look 10 years younger, and In Stitches, a memoir, as well as Playing God, The Evolution of a Modern Surgeon. That actually the first of his books that I had read. And it just had me literally in stitches. So he did. He had me in stitches. And he is a great, he is a great uh, physician and just a hysterical man. He's so funny. And he hosts the popular podcast called The Holistic Plastic Surgery Show. He's a social media star with over 2.7 million subscribers on YouTube and 7 million followers on TikTok. And he's an assistant professor of surgery at Oakland University, Wilmont. Bo uh, William Beaumont School of Medicine. Welcome, welcome back, Tony, to the Girlfriend Doctor Show. It is good to have you here. And we've Thank been you. chatting prior to this. You're telling us a little bit about, telling me a little bit about how you recreated, your, reinvented yourself during the pandemic. So will you please share that with my audience? Yeah, so back in March of 2020, like a lot of us, I found myself closing my office and not have, having any patients to take care of. And at the time, you know, it was kind of a scary time. Um, I volunteered to help out at the hospital, but thank God they didn't need me because if you're in the middle of an infectious pandemic and you need to call a plastic surgeon in to take care of patients, it's, it's got to be really bad. So I tried to think like, what can I do to help people during this time? And so I started making videos on YouTube, on Instagram and on TikTok. And with everybody sitting at home, I think they res really resonate with people. And at the time I thought, you know what? I'm gonna shed this whole surgeon thing that you have to act a certain way and just be myself. And uh, what I found is, is that by creating these videos, this content that was educational, that was entertaining, that was funny, and kind of hopefully a combination of all of that, I had so many people message me afterwards and they said, you know what, I was by myself during the, pen, during the quarantine and you helped keep me company. And, uh, you know, it's like I can treat 20 people in my office in a day or I can treat five or help 500,000 on so social media. And so it's just a privilege to be able to reach so many people and to hopefully help them throughout their daily lives. And you do it with humor. You do it with humor. 
And so I love that. I love that about you because like humor, laughter increases oxytocin and it is the best medicine for sure. One of your books is The Age Fix. And, you know, again, we're starting out the new year. So it's new year, new you, and you're all about transformation. But often you see people taking plastic surgery too far. And I really would love for you to address that. Yeah. So I have a saying um, that I do on all my YouTube videos. It's eat real food, use clean skincare, and only consider actual plastic surgery as a last resort. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, in medicine, especially in surgery, when we look at surgery as surgeons, we feel that the pinnacle of success is the biggest operation that you can do. So when you're in residency, you know, the pinnacle of a general surgeon is to do the Whipple. You know, that's like an eight to 10 hour cancer operation. And wow, if you get to scrub in on one of those, you're so lucky. And plastic surgery, the pinnacle is probably a facelift. And that's a big operation, takes, a, you know, three to four hours to perform. And at one point in my career, I realized that the goal was not necessarily, like a lot of surgeons believe, to perform the biggest operations in your practice, but to try to keep people out of the operating room. That's now where I find the success. And yes, there are certain things that to correct and to improve, you do need surgery, let's be realistic, but there's so much now that we can do outside of going to the OR that can help us look and feel our best. I'm a big proponent of that and really, you know, do what we can naturally. In, in GYN, the biggest, longest procedure is a pelvic exoneration, and mm -hmm. it is pretty much cleaning everything out of the pelvis, yeah. and it is an eight-hour long surgery, and we do it for cancer, typically cervical cancer um, uh, therapy. And so, yeah, and the goal, and this is what I learned. I used to do two to three surgeries a week as a gynecologist in general, minor and major, and, and doing what I do now with the functional medicine approach, bioidentical hormones, addressing underlying issues, it went to two to three per year that were needed, two to three major surgeries per year. So it's a huge difference. So what can we do now? And what is like, what should we pay most uh, attention to, especially women as we age and we go through menopause? Yeah, I mean, you, one of the things that you have covered extensively on your podcast is diet. And so, you know, the, there is not a specific diet that's best for the skin that may be different than what you would um, consume that's best for your general body. And so following a lot of the principles that you have outlined in your books, as well as on your podcast and social media is the, always going to be the first step. After that, it is about skincare and it's about taking care of your skin. And so there are certain things I recommend that everybody do. Uh, the first thing is to use a retinol or any, uh, any type of good anti-aging cream at night. The retinol is what I usually recommend as a starting point. It's the most studied anti-aging cream, uh, and it's usually pretty affordable. So to use that every night to every other night is a great way to help to turn back the clock and to keep your skin looking young. I also recommend to use an antioxidant serum every morning. Vitamin C is great. Uh, and then I recommend to use the sunscreen, an SPF at least 30. That's what the American Academy of Dermatology recommends uh, because we know that the number one ager, direct ager of our skin is UV radiation. And so blocking those sun's rays uh, can definitely be helpful. Okay, you've made that sound really simple because I was just like soap and water kind of gal, right? Soap and water, and I use some of my balance cream, my hormone cream too, on face, neck, around the eyes as well, and Jolva on my upper lips, as well as lower ones, a little inside story on that. Tony, but uh, you know, it's, it's so true, but those are, you know, it was always heard, okay, wash, tone, moisturize, night cream, eye cream. So, I mean, is there like, you have an amazing skincare line. I want to, I want you to share about that. And like, what's the, the simplest regimen that, mm -hmm. you know, is the best for us. And if we're not going outside, do we need sunscreen? So, you know, I, I'm not a dermatologist. And if you ask any dermatologist, they're going to say, you got to wear it, whether you're inside in a basement all day <laughs> or whether you're outside. So for me, I'll be honest, I don't wear sunscreen every day. I live in Detroit, Michigan, and like today, super cloudy. Um, and I also know that we need our vitamin D and then there, and some can be very therapeutic. So in general, if you're going to be out in the sun, I definitely recommend a daily sunscreen. That being said, you know, what we ended up doing, because just like you said, there's so much confusion of what should you put on your skin? You know, is, is this the best cream? Is that the best cream? This says it's better than Botox. Like, what do you do? So we ended up actually doing just a, a quick little test uh, on a handful of test subjects 
where we put them on a very simple skincare routine. It literally takes two minutes in the morning, two minutes at night. And after about two months, we found that they looked about five years younger. Now, this wasn't a, you know, this wasn't a, a peer-reviewed scientific study of thousands of people, but we did find that people had some really nice improvements. So what do you do, and this is bare minimum, but if you do this, you're gonna be ahead of 90% of everybody else. You cleanse your skin in the morning, you apply a, a, an antioxidant serum, like a vitamin C serum after that, and then the sunscreen. And technically in the morning, that's all you need. You don't need a toner necessarily. You don't need a moisturizer necessarily. If you just do those, that's technically all you need. At night, definitely important to cleanse your skin. You wanna get rid of the day's worth of grime and oil and makeup and pollution and all of that. Super, super important. And then you wanna apply the retinol or the other anti-aging cream. Retinol, once again, be the one that we usually recommend. There are growth factor creams, there are peptide creams. Um, those are acceptable alternatives as well. And technically, that's all you have to do at night, okay? If you wanna apply a moisturizer after that, it's wintertime, I'm in Michigan, it's super dry. By all means, apply a moisturizer, be comfortable. Moisturizers aren't truly anti-aging, they're just for comforting and hydrating your skin. And then the only other thing is, two to three times a week, if you've got quote unquote normal skin, maybe once a week, if you've got sensitive skin, you wanna exfoliate your skin, either with a good, good clean scrub, or you can do it chemically. There are chemical exfoliators out there that you can buy as well. And if that's all you do in the morning, you cleanse uh, the antioxidant serum, sunscreen, in the evening you cleanse, and the anti-aging cream, and then you exfoliate a couple times a week, you're gonna be way ahead of everybody else. Okay, that sounds great. And then talking about peptides, and then what's the state of the art right now? There's PRP facials, there's all kinds of fractionated laser facials and uh, you know, intense pulse light. And so when it comes to tech, there's we can spend tens of thousands of dollars a year on these yeah. things. What do you recommend? What would you say? Eh, not so, not so worth it, guys. Yeah, a lot of it comes down to what you're interested in changing, uh, what your issues may be, and how much you're willing to spend, and how much downtime you're willing to have. So, for example, you know, if you're looking at little downtime, not as much cost, but big reward, IPL is great, intense pulse light. Uh, a lot of med spas, a lot of doctor's offices have these. These are not the most expensive, like, lasers to buy, and so they are quite common, and they're great for age spots. So if your problem is that you've had a lot of sun in the past, and now you're turning 40, 50, 60, and you're seeing these spots really in your skin, then this is a great way to get rid of those spots. Uh, typically, you need a few treatments of it, and what will happen is, is it zaps those spots, the spots get darker, and then after about a week or so, they fall off. If you're just looking for overall anti-aging, just overall kind of tightening of the skin, rejuvenating of the skin, and you don't want to spend a lot of money, microneedling is a great option. Uh, microneedling essentially is kind of the old fashioned uh, dermal rollers that people would do. They would buy it online. We do that, except you can do that with an automated um, microneedling device that goes deeper than those dermal rollers do. And the idea is that you create some uh, controlled trauma to the upper surface of the skin and that can cause that collagen to tighten up. You wanna take that to the next level, you can use your own PRP where you draw the blood, you take the platelet-rich plasma out, you can apply that over the skin after the microneedling. That can give you a, a kind of that added anti-aging punch to it, but that does add a lot more cost, you know? And so that's kind of how you, you need to look at it is in general, the more downtime, the more change you're gonna get. Um, you know, you don't have to undergo, pay thousands and thousands of dollars on an expensive laser with a 10 to 14 day downtime to look and feel younger. There are so many other options now. I love that. So great options. And now you've seen some pretty crazy cases of plastic surgery. You talk about this on your, on your TikTok, which is amazing. You've got millions of followers, YouTube and Instagram. So what are some of the like most bizarre things that you thought, oh my God, why did that do that? Or was that real? Was that even real? Yeah, you know, there's some really crazy things going on in our field. There's a couple of things. I mean, the first thing is that there are people who are performing uh, surgical procedures who aren't even doctors. Uh, people who, uh, a lot of times, they come from other countries, they masquerade as, as doctors, and then they perform operations literally in hotel rooms. And what we're seeing is this, is all, all of these people, uh, typically you see a lot of it in Florida where people are victims of these uh, fraudulent kind of fake doctors who are injecting various substances into the buttocks 
as a way to enhance them. And there are people who've died from it. So that's one kind of group that we're seeing that's, that really is very, very disturbing. And the good thing is some of these people are being arrested who are performing these procedures and they're uh, being put in prison. The other thing that we are seeing uh, also though, um, are procedures that, you know, doctors who are doing too much. And, you know, plastic surgery for me, you know, I mentioned earlier that it's, a, it's great as a last resort for certain things. You know, if you've lost a bunch of weight, you've got skin hanging from your tummy, that it, the only way to really get rid of that skin is to do a tummy tuck. You know, if, if you've had three kids and you've breastfed and your breasts are, are, have gotten really droopy and it's, you know, it chafes and it's uncomfortable, then a breast lift can help that. You know, there's no cream we can put on it that will help it. But there is this tendency for some doctors to think, well, let's just add this surgery and add that surgery. And operations go from six hours to eight hours to 10 hours to 12 hours and it starts really, really getting dangerous. And so one of the things that I've done is I've limited any operations I do to about five hours, maybe five and a half at the most, uh, because really safety has to be the top priority. I appreciate your approach around that too, very much. Your gynecologist is an expert on your hormones, right? So have they told you which foods can affect your hormone balance? Well, if you're like most women, the answer is no. To be honest, there's often not time in a doctor's visit to go beyond the basics. And I should know, I'm a gynecologist, but food is medicine and our nutritional requirements change at certain times of the month and certainly as we age. Most of us trade tips with our sisters, friends, colleagues, but the truth is what works for them may not work for you. I'm Dr. Anna Quebec. I'm a triple board certified OBGYN and author of the best-selling books, The Hormone Fix and Keto Green 16. I've helped millions of women feel better, feel more energized and balance their hormones naturally. If you'd like to know which diet is right for you at this stage of your life, take my menu pause quiz to find out. And when we're doing like thinking about with hormones, peptides, like I put some peptides in my balance cream, tripeptide, because I wanted to add that additional anti-aging effect, you know, to support us. So what are, are you using peptides as well? Yeah. So the way we look at peptides for skincare is that they're chemical messengers. And these are chemical messengers that send signals to the deeper layers of your skin to help to rejuvenate them, you know, to turn over and, and all of that. Um, the way I look at peptides is in a more simple fashion, however, is that there are kind of like three categories of anti-aging ingredients that are most commonly used when you look at skincare. So the first group I mentioned earlier are the retinoids. They're derivatives of vitamin A. You know, the most aggressive is tretinoin, otherwise known as Retin-A. And then the retinol is the over-the-counter version. Once again, that's the most studied anti-aging ingredient that we've seen. If you ask dermatologists and plastic surgeons around the country, the vast majority of them would recommend a retinol or retin-A as their number one anti-aging cream. But they can be hard to tolerate for some people. They can dry your skin out. You can get a dermatitis initially. And for some people, you just can't, they just can't long-term use them. So the other two groups are growth factors, okay, which can be very expensive. And there also is, um, you know, some controversy associated with certain growth factor um, skincare lines. And then there are the peptides. And so for those people who don't tolerate the retinoids, then I usually recommend they go either with the growth factor based creams or the peptides. The good thing about the peptides is that they're not that expensive. And so you can get peptide based creams that are relatively inexpensive. The growth factor based creams can get can can get into the several hundreds of dollars for literally one ounce of product. Oh yeah, and then there's the face cream with gold in it. I've done that <laughs> one. I mean, I've got all kinds of good stuff, like, right? Just get so sucked Snail in. slime, and yeah, there's so much out there. Oh Snake yeah. Snake venom. <laughs> So lots of good stuff. You know, I have rosacea. And that's one of the things that I struggled with throughout yeah. my life. And, and uh, when I heard that uh, there was a new cream out for rosacea that was ivermectin, right? Topical mm -hmm. ivermectin called Sulantra for yep. um, rosacea. I tried it and it was beautiful. Like I, I used one round and that's it. But of course, always worth watching my coffee, 
watching my wine, watching, you know, and I want to, rosacea is a really tough thing. And what, how do you approach a patient who has rosacea, you know, early on? And then there are severe, I remember seeing a gentleman with just terrible rosacea. I mean, the nose distorts, right? And so how do you, how do you help those individuals? So rosacea is very difficult. It's stubborn. I myself, like you have had you know, have struggled with it at times as well. Um, so obviously the first thing, and you mentioned earlier, is to avoid triggers. And if you can figure out what some of these triggers are, and, and they're various, you know, it could be heat for some people, uh, it could be alcohol for some people, um, you know, it could be coffee for some people. You just don't know, everybody is kind of different. Uh, I agree with you, I think the cilantro, the ivermectin, and, you know, ivermectin now with a whole other, if you mentioned that and it brings up all this other stuff, um, but yeah, that's, I think, a very interesting treatment for it because that targets the mites, the skin mites that, and they don't really know exactly how ivermectin helps with rosacea. It just seems to help. Uh, and some people have rosacea and they have this overgrowth of these natural mites that grow on your skin and somehow reducing that number seems to help with some people. There are yeah. other medications. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, and just thinking with those mites too, I mean, the skin, they're natural skin mites, right? Yeah. But also uh, one of the reasons for dry eye, dry eye syndrome, are, is some of that bacteria, mites, infection. So, whole, And it's interesting because, you know, functional medicine docs have talked about the gut microbiome for years, you know, back when traditional physicians have poo-pooed it and like, oh, what are they talking about? That doesn't mean anything. And now what we're actually finding out is that there's not just the gut microbiome that is important to your health, but the skin has its own microbiome as well. And a lot of the things that we used to do with our skin, you know, when you and I were growing up in the 80s and the 90s, where you would, you know, really scrub your skin and you would use alcohol-based toners and strip your skin of its natural oils and the bacteria, it's actually not good for your skin. And so there has been this definite trend in the last 10, seven to 10 years or so of skincare getting much more mild and of realizing that the microbiome actually of the skin is important and you don't want to disrupt it. That being said, like overgrowth that you can get, you know, of the bad bacteria in your gut, you can get overgrowth on your skin as well. And we're just really learning about that. You know, and it's funny because we'll have arguments, which is the most important microbiome, your gut microbiome, your skin microbiome, and of course, me and GYN, your vaginal microbiome. I there mean, it's go. critically important for the next generation. So, so that trumps all other microbiome, <laughs> but it's all related, right? It's all related. And it's so important to address that. And I remember this beautiful, um, uh, time, this presentation by Dr. David Perlmutter, when he was talking about the gut microbiome and he brought out on stage at the end of his lecture, he pulled up a chair and he was just like Mr. Rogers and he's reading a book here and he, he read Horton Hears a Who. <laughs> Horton Hears a Who. So you guys, homework for you. That is such a good book. But if you just think of that, those little, that Whoville is that gut microbiome, is that microbiome that is so essential for our life and we have to honor it and treasure it and, and, and really recognize how precious it is that um, you will have a whole nother, another attention span. And it's still not common. I mean, especially now with flus and colds and this and that, and is it, is it COVID? Is it something else? It's, you know, one round of antibiotics. And it's not just, hey, here's some amoxicillin. It's, well, let's start with the Z-Pak. Let's go to Leviquin. And I'm like, whoa, 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 you were negative. Like you, you were, you know what I mean? Like what is going on? Like why? And it's gun after gun after gun. And then that's going to create a dysbiosis again with an increase in candidiasis, which is going to have other effects on our skin. So chronic yeast infections on the skin, well, not to mention, of course, chronic sinusitis. And I have allergies today. This is not yeast infection, <laughs> nasal drainage today that I'm having. But um, been, I haven't had antibiotics and I can't remember how long. So, um, but recurrent yeast infections as a result and also on the skin. So when uh, you, you must have treat, you must treat tons of, of um, yeast issues on the skin. How do you do that? We call it tinium, all different kinds of tinium. So since I not since I have plastics, um, that's something I actually do send to my dermatology colleagues. Um, I do treat a lot of cellulitis, and because I do a lot of surgery, you know, I do prescribe a good amount of antibiotics. And therein lies the challenge. You know, when you do surgery, I, I think in the end it's kind of a 
risk benefit ratio to an extent. You know, if I've got somebody who's got, who's had surgery and now they've developed a cellulitis, yes, I'm going to put them on an antibiotic because the risk of not treating that cellulitis is, is too high. Um, you and I have both seen in our training and stuff, people who've had, you know, infections that have gotten out of control. Uh, that being said, just like you said, I think in general, there's antibiotics are being overprescribed in so many ways, you know, and I think people don't talk about the antibiotics that are used to create, you know, in the food supply and how much, you know, I think it's over half and I, I can't give you the exact number off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure it's over half of the antibiotics that are technically used in this country. I think it's like even, maybe even as high as like 70%. I heard 80%. Being, okay, there you go. Okay. Yeah, are being used to give to feed animals just because where they live is so filthy. And, that gross. That's you know, so and, gross. and it's one thing where, yes, you know, I know we have doctors who are prescribing, you know, <laughs> pediatricians where they have moms come in, like, I want my Augmentin now for my kid, or I want my Moxicillin now. Sure. And it's a hard position for them to be in. That's part of it, but the other part of it is all the antibiotics being used in other things. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And then again, our defense is the probiotics. And then not to forget that when we're creating that dysbiosis to probably put a good round of antifungals in there too, mm -hmm. and or good uh, yeast, so to Saccharomyces. So a good, you know, diverse multi-strain lactobacilli and bacteroides species when in your probiotic. And you guys, that's um, something I think that is part of, it's part of my daily routine. It's part of my daily packs. And um, I think that's just good defense because just eat out once a week and you've got it likely, unless it's grass fed, free range, you know, or you're eating buffalo meat. They've, they are the most um, revered animal meat in our planet and has been uh, laws against it being uh, them being treated with so many hormones and antibiotics, et cetera, unless when necessary. So it's pretty, you know, it's pretty fascinating when we're thinking about the food chain, but also how that affects our gut. Mm -hmm. So uh, Tony, when it comes again to transformation, is there a uh, procedure that you love doing the most? I'm going to do some rapid fire questions on okay. you right now, mister. <laughs> One of the things I enjoy the most, if you're looking at surgery, is fat injections, fat grafting. So one of the things that I trained in way back in 04, 05, with one of the top guys in the country is fat grafting, where we take fat from the tummy or the thighs, purify it, then inject it into the face for a true three-dimensional rejuvenation. Uh, and it's great because now you look at regenerative medicine and, and they're using stem cells and, and PRP. Well, fat was the original regenerative medicine. And, uh, and it's been great. I mean, it's, as long as you don't overdo it, I think it's a great, great treatment. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what is your favorite food you love to eat? Oh, geez. You know what? I don't have a favorite food specifically, I guess one of the, my lately, my big favorite has been smoothie bowls. I just like it, it for some reason I don't get sick of it. Uh, we, we eat a lot of different types of food in my family. Um, and so I don't tend to do the same thing all the time, but that's the one thing I could probably have that for breakfast every morning. Very cool. Okay. What's your favorite cocktail? Uh, I actually rarely drink. That's one of the things that um, I, I will have a glass of wine here or there, a beer maybe once every three or four months, but I don't drink hard liquor. I, it's just never been my thing. And health-wise, I just don't see any benefit to it. Awesome. Okay. And what is your favorite exercise? Uh, favorite exercise would have to be, well, my favorite sport is tennis. So I love playing tennis. Lately, uh, I've been getting into the Peloton stuff and I've been spending a lot of time doing yoga. Uh, as I'm nearing 50, I'm, I'm figuring out that I'm not nearly as, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm more stiff than I think I ever was before. <laughs> and this has definitely been helping me. So I'm definitely becoming definitely a, a huge fan of yoga. Very right, cool. And in your downtime, what do you love to do? Uh, I love to think up and create. So like you, I love writing books. Uh, I've had three books out. I just finished a proposal for my fourth book. Congratulations. Uh, also, thank you. But I also love creating different video ideas, whether it's for TV or social media. Uh, it's creation that I just really, really enjoy. Yeah, I see that in you because I can tell you love it. And I love your sense of humor. Oh, All you. right. Uh, last and final question. For now, what is your favorite sexual position? Oh, I guess I'm kind of, oh, this is, this is so uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm a traditionalist, so I would just say missionary. 
Okay. Um, All right. Good. To I got to make sure my parents don't listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for playing along. I I, <laughs> Thanks, I love talking to you and I'm, I'm really blessed to have you on the show and I look forward to uh, connecting with you more. Please tell our audience where they can connect with you and also get your great skincare line. Thank you. So yeah, my skincare line is at yoonbeauty.com. Uh, it is made with natural and organic ingredients. Uh, and the idea is it's kind of a combination of um, natural and organic with medically active components like vitamin C, retinol, kojic acid, and all that good stuff. So that's at youandbeauty.com. Otherwise, I'm all over social media. If you look me up, you'll be able to find me. And I want to let you know, Anna, that I really appreciate you inviting me on your podcast. I love what you're doing, and, uh, and it's great spending some time with you. Great spending time with you, too. Well, thank you again, and God bless you, and I'll see you, you around soon. I can't wait. Thank and you. And congratulations on all you do. Thank you. Beauty from the inside out and the outside in is really our number one goal. We talk about shining as one of my pillars in the Girlfriend Doctor uh, platform, right? In my, in my Girlfriend Doctor brand. And so it is so key that we are doing what we can from the inside, healing our gut microbiome, keeping a clean, healthy diet, and looking at what we're using on our skin, that it is natural and it is beneficial and it is without anything that could otherwise hurt our hormones. And that old way that we were cleaning our skins, like with the alcohol and the astringents, don't serve us and, and don't, you know, don't serve our kids. So there are options. And also, we want to look our best as we move forward. So all the steps that we take to do so make a difference. And it's often about doing less and not more. And which is why I wanted to share Dr. Anthony Yoon on today's Girlfriend Doctor show. So to remind you, Yoon Beauty, Y-O-U-N beauty.com. And again, he's all over Instagram and YouTube and TikTok. It's just hysterical. So for a good laugh, which increases oxytocin, and we love that, stay tuned. <laughs> And also just to remind you to share this episode and share others, put a comment here under this episode, whether you're um, watching it on YouTube or on my website or listening, wherever you're listening, please reach out to me and my team and let me know what topics you want to hear about, what questions you have, because you can ask or tell me anything. There is no such thing as TMI. And I love being your girlfriend doctor. Till next time. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel here and get those notifications and comment below. Let me know your thoughts, what you loved and what your action step is.